Hello, Set Apart Saints. This is David. And in this lesson, I will continue the verse-by-verse -verse explanation of Matthew 24, going through verses 6 through 10. So please put aside any preconceived notions of what pastors have told you and just look at what Scripture is proclaiming. The enemy has caused people to assign the Olivet Discourse's fulfillment to the end times so that they don't understand the truth about what happened in the first century. Matthew 24, 6 says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The context of the Olivet Discourse is Messiah's declaration in Matthew 23 that judgment would come upon the Jewish leaders in that generation. Then Messiah proclaimed that their temple would be destroyed. The disciples understood that Jerusalem would be attacked by an army who made war against it. The war that the disciples were concerned about was foretold in Daniel 9.26, which says, And they shall destroy the city and sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. So, Messiah has given you, and we'll get to that in a second, he's pointing to the end. Here's what's going to happen up until the end. Right? And he says the end is not yet. Okay, so here in Daniel 9.26, we see exactly the same narrative. The city and the sanctuary are going to be destroyed, and the end therefore shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So we understand the context of Messiah's Olivet Discourse and the war that the saints are looking for. Daniel 12 also foretold the war, saying that it shall be for a time times and half a time and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people the jews all these things shall be fulfilled so the disciples understood from daniel that war in judea would desolate jerusalem the temple and the jewish nation they understood messiah's parable of the wedding feast in matthew 22 when he said but when the king heard thereof he was wroth and he sent forth armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. So it's pointing to the Jews not accepting Messiah's invitation to join with him, to revere him as their promised Messiah, but instead they rejected him so they didn't enter into the wedding feast. And so the king, the heavenly father, is wroth and he's going to send forth armies to destroy the Jews and burn up Jerusalem. And the disciples heard Messiah proclaim, For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies, so we're referring to the Romans who were oppressing the Jews in Israel, shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee around, they will circle you, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knew not the time of thy visitation. So right there he's saying, they're not going to leave one stone upon another which is exactly what Messiah said earlier in the Olivet Discourse. So Messiah is telling the disciples that there would be wars around them and rumors and threats of war in Judea, but those weren't the sign that the desolation was near. Josephus recorded that Vitellius, governor of Syria, declared war against Eretas, king of Arabia, and wished to lead his army through Palestine. But the death of Tiberius in 37 AD prevented that war. So there's a rumor of war. A riot occurred in Egypt that Roman Emperor Caligula had to quill, which resulted in the execution of Egypt prefect Alice Avilius Flaccus in 38 AD. In 39 AD, Agrippa accused Herod Antipas, the tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, of planning a rebellion against Roman rule with the help of Parthia. Herod Antipas confessed and Caligula exiled him. In 40 AD, riots erupted in Alexandria between Jews and Greeks. The Jews were accused of not honoring the emperor. In Jamnia, the Jews were angered by the erection of a clay altar and destroyed it, which brought ire from Caligula. He responded by having a colossal statue of himself made of brass, which he planned to set up in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, which would have caused a war. But Caligula died in 41 AD before the order was carried out. Regarding the phrase, but the end is not yet, we can see that there were wars and rumors of wars, but they took place decades before the desolation of Jerusalem, the temple, and the Jewish nation in 70 AD. Albert Barnes notes on the Bible from 1838 says, The end of the Jewish economy, the destruction of Jerusalem, will not immediately follow. 
Be not therefore alarmed when you hear of those commotions. Other signs will warn you when to be alarmed and seek security. Koch's commentary on the Holy Bible from 1803 says, The end of the age, or Jewish dispensation, and the demolition of the temple will not be immediately on the back of these things. John Gill's exposition of the entire Bible from 1748 says, Meaning, not the end of the world, but the end of Jerusalem, and the temple, the end of the Jewish state, which were to continue, and did continue, after these disturbances in it. Matthew Poole's commentary on the Holy Bible from 1683 says, our Savior tells them that these things should be, but the end should not be presently, which anyone that will read Josephus' history of the wars of the Jews will see abundantly verified upon the taking of Jerusalem by the Roman armies. So do you see how the great theologians of the 17th through 19th century point to the historical fulfillment of Messiah's Olivet Discourse? It's not until the last few centuries that the enemy's false futuristic explanations have taken hold. The end is referred to in these verses, in Matthew 24, 6, which we just read, And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Matthew 24, 13, But he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. And the next verse, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. So we'll get to those verses, and I'll show you the, the fulfillment of those verses, which point to the end. Daniel 12, 8-9, which points to the three and a half years of the Jewish-Roman War of 66-70 to 70 AD, says, And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. The end of these things happened in 70 AD, when the Roman army flooded into Jerusalem, killing hundreds of thousands of Jews by the sword. The book of Daniel 12 was closed up and sealed from the eyes of the Jews, lest they understand their pending judgment and flee Jerusalem to escape. So Daniel 12 is not about the end times. Daniel 12 is pointing to a three and a half year period, pointing to the judgment of the Jewish nation, which is declared in Matthew 23 and Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 7 says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. The disciples were warned about battles between nations and kingdoms around Judea. Adam Clark's commentary on the Bible says, This portended the dissensions, insurrections, and mutual slaughter of the Jews and those of other nations who dwelt in the same cities together as particularly at Caesarea, where the Jews and Sirius contended about the right of the city, which ended there in the total expulsion of the Jews, above 20,000 of whom were slain. The whole Jewish nation, being exasperated at this, flew to arms and burnt and plundered the neighboring cities and villages of the Syrians, making an immense slaughter of the people. The Syrians, in return, destroyed not a less number of the Jews. At Scythopolis, they murdered upwards of 13,000 Jews, at Ascalon, they killed 2,500 Jews. Ptolemus, they slew 2,000 and made many prisoners. The Tyrians also put many Jews to death and imprisoned more. The people of Gadara did likewise, and all the other cities of Syria in proportion as they hated and feared the Jews. At Alexandria, the Jews and heathens fought, and 50,000 of the former were slain. The people of Damascus conspired against the Jews of that city, and assaulting them unarmed, killed 10,000 of them. This portended the open wars of different tetrarchies in the provinces against each other, that of the Jews and Galileans against the Sumerians, for the murder of some Galileans going up to the Feast of Jerusalem, while Cominus was procurator, that of the whole nation of Jews against the Romans in Agrippa and other allies of the Roman Empire, which began when Gessius Florus was procurator, that of the civil war in Italy, while Otho and Vitellius were contending for the empire. And famines are the natural result of civil wars. Acts eleven twenty seven to twenty nine alludes to the famine in the time of Claudius, who ruled from forty one to fifty four A.D. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Adam Clark's commentary on the Bible says, It is farther added 
that there shall be famines and pestilences. There was a famine foretold by Agabus, which is mentioned by Suetonius, Tacitus, and Eusebius, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar, and was so severe at Jerusalem that Josephus says many died for lack of food. Pestilences are the usual attendants of famine, as the scarcity and badness of provisions generally produce epidemic disorders. Acts 16.26 describes a great earthquake in Macedonia, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Adam Clark's commentary on the Bible says, There were several in those times to which our Lord refers, particularly one in Crete in the reign of Claudius, one at Smyrna, Miletus, Chios, and Samos, one at Rome mentioned by Tacitus, and one at Laodicea in the reign of Nero, in which the city was overthrown, as were likewise Heropolis and Colossus, one at Campania, mentioned by Seneca, and one at Rome in the reign of Galba, mentioned by Suetonius in the life of that emperor. Add in all these, a dreadful one in Judea, mentioned by Josephus, accompanied by a dreadful tempest, violent winds, venomous showers, and continual lightnings and thunders, which led many to believe that these things portended some uncommon calamity. Luke 21.11 adds an interesting statement. And the great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. Adam Clark's commentary on the Bible says, Josephus, in his preface to the Jewish war, enumerates these fearful sights and great signs. The first one, a star hung over the city like a sword, and a comet continued a whole year. The second sign is that the people being assembled at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the ninth hour of the night, a great light shone about the altar and the temple, and this continued for half an hour. The third sign was that at the same feast, a cow was led to sacrifice, brought forth a lamb in the midst of the temple. So it's saying it birthed a lamb. The fourth sign, the eastern gate of the temple, which was of solid brass and very heavy and could hardly be shut by 20 men, and was fastened by strong bars and bolts, was seen at the sixth hour of the night to open of its own accord. Matthew 24, 8 says, All these are the beginning of sorrows. So these are just the initial signs, which increased in intensity toward 66 AD when the tribulation in Judea increased dramatically. Matthew 24, 9 says, Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So, again, he's pointing to you, the disciples, and ye, the disciples. He's not pointing to the end times. He's not pointing to the saints in the end times. He's pointing to the disciples who he's speaking to in a private conversation, saying, you're going to be delivered up. The corresponding passage in Mark and Luke confirms that Messiah was foretelling what his disciples would see. He said that they would be delivered up to Jewish synagogues. In Mark 13, 9, it says, but take heed to yourselves. For they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. Luke twenty one twelve says, But before all these they shall lay their hands on you, and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues, and into prisons, being brought forth before kings and rulers for my name's sake. So being delivered up into synagogues points to life in Judea, where there's Jewish synagogues, and the Jews were the ones, the unbelieving Jews, were the ones that were causing the most persecution in the first century. Messiah is telling his disciples that they would be afflicted and killed, and the historical record proves that was the case. They were first persecuted by the Jewish leaders, then by the Roman leaders, and the people in the many nations of the Roman Empire. Some were in prison like Peter and John. Acts 4.3 says, And they laid hands upon them, and they did put them in custody until the morrow, for it was evening already. And they were brought before the council of Jewish leaders. Acts 4.5-6 says, And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. After Messiah's disciples healed people and cast out unclean spirits, they were brought before the Sadducees again. Acts 5.18 says, And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. 
and they were beaten by the Sadducees. Acts 5, 40-41 says, And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. So Messiah told them, you're going to be delivered up to councils. You're going to be delivered up into synagogue, and you're going to be beaten. So he foretold this in the Olivet Discourse, and here in Acts, we see the exact fulfillment. In 51 AD, the Apostle Paul wrote about the Jewish persecutions of the saints. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14-16 says, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Herod Agrippa, governor of Judea, intending to ingratiate himself with the Jews, raised sharp persecution against the saints and determined to make an effectual blow by striking at their leaders. Acts 12, 1-3 says, Now at that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. James the just, the man who was fitted, if any could be, to reconcile the Jews to the Father, was killed by his hardened brethren, for whom he daily interceded in the temple. At the age of ninety-four, he was beaten with a fuller's club and stoned by the Jews. Peter and Paul were both martyred in Rome about 66 AD during the persecution under Emperor Nero. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified, upside down at his request, since he did not feel he was worthy to die in the same manner as his Messiah. Andrew is said to have been crucified in Greece. He was taken and killed on a cross, the two ends of which were fixed transversely in the ground. Hence the derivation of the term, St. Andrew's Cross. Doubting Thomas, called Didymus, preached the gospel in Parthia, in India, where exciting the pagan priest's rage, he was martyred by being thrust through with a spear. Philip the Roman proconsul had Philip arrested. He was scourged, thrown in prison, and afterward crucified in 54 AD. Matthew. Some reports say he wasn't martyred, while others say he was stabbed to death in Ethiopia, in the city of Nadaba in 60 AD. Bartholomew. There are various accounts of how he met his death as a martyr for the gospel. It appears that he was at length cruelly beaten and then crucified by the impatient idolaters. James, the son of Alphaeus. Josephus reported that he was stoned and then clubbed to death. Simon the Zealot. He was killed after refusing to sacrifice to the sun god. It is reported that he was crucified in Britain. Mattias. Tradition sends him to Syria with Andrew and to death by stoning. Mark. He was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria at the great solemnity of Serapis, their idol ending his life under their merciless hands. Luke, he was supposed to have been hanged on an olive tree by Greece's idolatrous priests. Jude, the brother of James, was commonly called Thaddeus. He was crucified at Edessa. Judas, not Iscariot, was stoned to death. And then there's John, and an early Latin tradition had him escaping unhurt after being cast into boiling oil in Rome. He was the only apostle who escaped the violent death. So Messiah said, you're going to be delivered up to councils. You're going to be delivered up to kings. And they're going to persecute you. And they're going to kill you. And that's exactly what we see in the record, the historical record. We see that taking place. Matthew 24, 10 says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Messiah is telling his disciples what they would face before the desolation of the temple. Being a follower of Messiah in the culture of Judaism invited persecution even from family members. Luke 21.16 says, And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinfolks and friends, and some of you they shall cause to be put to death. John Gill's exposition of the entire Bible says, That is, many who had been hearers of the apostles and professors of the Christian religion, who were highly pleased with it and were strenuous advocates for it, while things were tolerably quiet and easy, but when they saw the apostles, some of them beaten and imprisoned, others put to death, another forced to flee from place to place, and persecutions and affliction because of Christ and his gospel, 
likely to befall themselves, would be discouraged hereby and stumble at the cross, and fall out from the faith of the gospel and the profession of it, regarding betraying one another, he says, meaning that the apostates would befall off from the Christian religion, would prove treacherous to true believers, and give in their names to the persecutors, or inform them where they were, that they might take them, and deliver them into their hands themselves. These were the false brethren. The apostle Paul was in perils among, regarding hating one another, he says, not that the true Christians would hate these false brethren any more than betray them, for they are taught to love all men, even their enemies, but these apostates should hate them, in whose communion they were before, and in whom they belonged and even to the very great degree of hatred, as it often is seen, that such who turn their backs on Christ and his gospel prove the most bitterest enemies and the most violent persecutors of its preachers and followers. So we can see that the prophecies in Matthew 24, 5-10 were fulfilled before the Jewish-Roman War of 66-70 AD and the desolation of Jerusalem, the temple, and the Jewish nation. That's all for today. I'll continue the discussion in the next video. I love y'all. Shalom.